Welcome back to Nomad Boat Building. I'm Mark Bruton, and we've been working on the shear structure of the Catalina Wherry. The shear structure is a combination of elements. It's the quarter knees, it is the in whales and out whales, and the breast hook. These things are all connected together to form a stiff girder around the perimeter of the boat. Now in the last episode, we created an element called a transom brace. That's a stick that crosses the breadth of the transom that stiffens it up. Now our transom does not need any more stiffening, but the customer requested one. He likes the look of it, so we've obliged. Now you notice throughout the next few videos that you might see elements of the boat that have been built and showing up in the video that we have not yet discussed. That's because all of these things kind of get built in unison. But I'm going to compartmentalize the various components to make it a little more digestible for the videos. So if you see something that I haven't dealt with in the background, don't worry, we'll get to it. Now this week we're going to move on to the quarter knees. The quarter knees are going to connect that transom brace to the shear of the boat, or the in whales and out whales. Now before we can start doing any of the other shear structure, we need to do something called horning in the boat. So let's talk about that now. Now the one thing that you absolutely should be doing before fitting breast hooks and quarter knees in is doing what's called horning in the boat. In a plywood boat like a, such as this, um, it's, it's a hard thing to do because there's so much stiffness built into the boat. In fact, I'm not even going to really try and do it as I normally would. But if this were a traditionally built boat where there's a lot more flexibility, horning in basically means you take your corners of your transom and you triangulate to your stem and you make sure that they're squared up so that they're both equal. And that's going to affect the shape of the boat a little bit along its length. I've already was playing around with this and there, I just, I cannot make the budge at all. So the best I can do though, is to make sure that the stem and the transom are both dead plumb. So we plumbed up across the midships and I put some blocking in to make sure the boat's staying put there. And then we've done the same thing back here with bracing here at the transom and bracing at the stem, making sure that these things are all nicely leveled up and rock solid and we put some bracing down below to basically block the, the bottom of the boat in so it's not shifting back and forth on the strong back and that's making sure everything's rock solid so with that done I can move on to actually fitting these quarter knees. The way we're going to build our knees is we're going to create a laminated knee with a solid wood blocking for the inside corner. We're doing that because it doesn't make sense to run the laminations all the way to the inside corner. It's a lot of extra material and work to try and fill in that corner and it's simpler to create a nice sweeping lamination that's of a reasonable thickness and then fill in the blank with just some solid stock. Pencil flattened on one side nice and sharp. Just follow those contours. Now if your pencil isn't flattened on one side, you can't really do this very accurately. The chances are you're just going to be tucking the corner into something and guaranteed you'll find a gap somewhere that's going to throw off your blind. By doing this, even if the door skin isn't lying flush with your surfaces, your pencil will project up to give you a reasonably accurate line. Find the side of our stem or frame here. I'll mark the face of it too but this is not an accurate number because it's uh our frames are not yet fared in properly at least at the where the haunch is for the in whales. But the rest of it looks good. I want to mark my center line. I'll put I'll mark it on the back where I know I can find it. But I want to mark it on the inside. Now we don't need a pattern that's this fussy for this particular stage of the process, but this will come in handy when it comes to actually fitting the knee in. We'll be making a separate pattern from the other side in order to ensure that we have true accuracy on each side. It can be really hard to get in here and do marks like this accurately, which is why I mark it on the back side too. I think I'm hitting it, but I can't even quite tell. The, uh... The angle I got to view it at is so odd. Yeah, I think so. Okay, luckily I don't need to reference that center line super accurately. Okay, so there's that side. 
Now, just mark that one, starboard. And we'll do the other side. The reason we make patterns for both sides of the boat is because despite your best efforts, your boat is never going to be 100% symmetrical. So you might as well accept that and just take a few moments to do a second pattern. It's far easier to do that than to fuss around trying to cut the bolt to be exactly the same and then have to do some excessive fitting operation on the one that isn't going to fit in the first place. We don't need this pattern for this particular stage of the build because we still have to make our knees or the blanks that are going to become our knees. But we might as well pattern for it now and then we've got both patterns to work with later on. Now in order to make our laminated knee, we're going to need some lamination. So we're going to make those out of white oak. And I've got a table saw sled that I use for making these. This is a really simple setup that has a nice tray to drop your finished laminations into. And what I like about it is I don't need to adjust anything. So the blade is set to give me a 1 8 inch wide lamination. The sled rides in the T-slot on the table and there's a little extension on the back of that sled that carries the billet that I'm going to be cutting from and pushes it all the way through. So it makes it very easy to control it. And when I'm done, I like to draw a little justification mark on all those parts so that I can keep them oriented the same in the finished product. Now I just want to square up these laminations by trimming the rough end off and we're ready to start gluing. We're going to drill a hole straight through this whole billet right here. Do that over on the drill press. Okay, here we go. Here's our setup. We're ready for a screw to go through here. Got a pile of clamps on hand. I shouldn't need any backing blocks on here because this backing strap is quite stiff. So I think I'll be fine with that. I may, I'll probably orient this down towards the corner of the bench as I get the glue up going because I feel like there's enough mass here that it might want to start torquing things around. And so it'll be nice if I can actually clamp the whole the whole uh, jig down toward the corner of the bench as I get closer there, but I'll leave it the way it is for now. And we've got a piece of scrap out here that's the same thickness as these pads here, and that's to carry the tail end here so that this isn't uh, li trying to lie down on the table. It keeps it all nice and even. We'll get some glue out and we'll start gluing this up. And I think I'm gonna do this with Tight Bond 3. It glues well to oak, and uh, it's nice and fast to use compared to epoxy. So that's what we're gonna do. Now, despite the fact that we're not using epoxy, we still need to work fairly quickly because you'd be surprised how fast these glues can start to seize up on you. And what I've learned by uh, trial and error is that we need to be generous enough on these that they've, there's enough um, volume because it does soak into the wood some. And if you're too dry on them, you'll find you get very dry glue lines. So. At least on one surface, I want to be quite generous. Let's see. I'm just going to move some of this off of here to the next one. Of course, we've got to be careful that we're staying on top of our orientation. So if I put a nice generous bead down on one side, and then I can be a little lighter on the other side. If you're too heavy, it just it can get real sloppy and hard to get it all to squeeze together. Okay. Try and be very careful about keeping your whole orientation here the same. It's, it's, it's really easy to sort of lose track of that. Of 
course it goes without saying we want to make sure we don't have sawdust in these joints so being careful to check your stock as you're going Here's something else I learned from doing repetitive stuff um, is if your glue bottle isn't absolutely full, drop it down on its side because that means you're that much closer to your glue being near the spout where you need it. Not spending all this time trying to shake it down towards the spout. A little light there. You do not want to be lazy about doing this sort of gluing, this spreading process because last thing you want to do is get way down the road in your uh, joinery to find that you've got some a dry spot or a, one veneer that didn't bond properly because you didn't glue it up properly. That would really suck. And then you're screwing around trying to squeeze like epoxy into this hairline joint that doesn't and most of the time it doesn't want to go in there. So diligence now is well, well worth it. Sometimes I'll lay out a whole bunch of these flat and try and do a larger area at once, but I don't honestly feel like it really uh, improves your productivity at all. Most of the time you're trying to chase gaps that that are showing up because you've got some slight irregularities in your stock and your roller can't hit the whole surface at once. Now Type Bond 3 is pretty good for this kind of thing because it has a pretty long open cure time uh, compared to other other glues of this type. Other carpenter glues tend to kind of kick off faster like Type Bond 2 certainly kicks off a little bit faster. I think um, I think there's a lot of carpenters that don't use Type Bond 3 because they don't like the fact that it doesn't feel like it gets sticky fast enough. I feel like it's a bit watery. But that's exactly what we want for this. And it should be known this this particular glue has the exact same waterproof rating as epoxy or, or better. I know when I was doing the cut water on the boat here, I uh, I was a little lighter on my gluing, on my glue, and I was having trouble getting the squeeze out I wanted. So I was a little worried that was going to show up in the final product. It, it didn't, luckily, but I was a bit close. Okay, the last one. Okay. Just make sure that's all lined up. Good. screw.
Now, if you're going to do any clamping downwards, you need to think about that early on because as soon as you start getting around the corner, it's going to lock up hard. Make it? Nope. I find it's fairly important to gently work your way around the bend rather than clamping at one end and then trying to bend the whole stack around the mold in one shot and then come back and try and clamp in between. There's an awful lot of pressure that gets applied at the turn of that bend and if you don't go at it slowly it's very easy for it to become immovable once you do try and apply your clamps and it's easy to actually squeeze voids into the middle of the stack if you've got both ends pinned down. It's equally important to add those blocks to apply downward pressure and bring those laminations into alignment as you work your way forward. Because again, as those laminations come around that corner, it's going to lock up tight and it can be almost impossible to move those laminations later on. Now I've just got a light touch on these guys here. They're just some gentle pressure downwards so that they don't, they don't restrict the movement of the whole stack. You can see how it's all starting to shift on me because of the pressure. You notice how I'm like using my hip to assist with the clamping here, just pushing the stack in, moving it in a ways, and I gotta get it clamped down again. Ooh, now I'm getting to, got a little bit of a problem here. I, uh, I have to clamp out here. I can't get a clamp into this spot because of the because of the bench configuration. So we'll do this. That's good, I'm still high right here and that's a bit problematic. Let's see if I can't figure out a way to bring that down. All right, so we need that. I need blocking back here. So we use cantilever pressure to solve this problem. So putting a cantilever across the whole thing here in order to bring down the stack in the middle. I'll just loosen off on these clamps a little bit here. Hopefully we can get it to come down. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Good. I think I want to get one more clamp in here. Reach. Yes, that'll reach. That looks good. Not sure, do I want one more there? Let's see if I can even squeeze it in.
Barely. Fantastic. Okay, let's have a look at our lamination here. I didn't account for spring back, but oh, there we go. That's not, that's fine. Eighth of an inch. Looks great. All right, now this has been sitting a full 24 hours, which is, I think, prudent. Where is my driver gun now? This pile? No. Okay. Backing band. That beautiful, beautiful. What I might even do is actually, um, because this is probably still got some curing time, I'll clamp it to the edge of the bench like like so, just to make sure that it sort of stays put. That this the springiness stays the way it is, and uh, might even clamp it in three spots. And that'll just help to make sure it cures as well as possible before I uh, let it live on its own. Because this, this glue is fairly flexible stuff. All right, over here is my, uh, remember my, my plan for these quarter knees. So I'll just, I've got a center line mark, which I'll drop on the drawing over here and swing the other one until it's sort of in the general neighborhood of where it needs to finish up over there. And this is, it is a little bit rough, so I have to be careful about how much I, faith I put into this. But it, it's, it's, in the, it's in the ballpark. And if I move this in, it's fine. If I move this out, it's, I, got, I got the wiggle room to play around with it. So I'm generally going to park it right about there. And I want to fill in this little bit here, which we'll just refer to as dead wood. So I've made up a block here that's going to go in here. And I've just simply taken these points and just kind of carried them up give myself some wiggle room. I just want to make sure that I've shoot past those points so that this covers this whole space. And I have to be careful about how deep I go as well because there's a limit to uh, this back corner here. I need to make sure I'm covering that off. I'm just going to eyeball where I think this is landing here and there. Okay. So we're just using this stuff as blocking. Lift this up. Ideally, I want both my parts to be about the same. So that looks like that's going to work out pretty good right there. So I'm just going to trace that on. And now we'll take this over to the bandsaw, cut it out. And then we'll onto the belt sander to rough this in so that we get that uh, fitting nicely. Okay, it's taking a little fussing and fitting, but here's my two parts. They're fitting pretty good. This is my show face. I flip it over. My, my back face is not quite as good, and that's because there's some slight variations in the, in the materials here. Something, I don't know, I, I can't get it better. Uh, I think it's just like some inaccuracy in the sander. It doesn't cut, doesn't sand everything quite square. But anyhow, I, I got a reasonable fit here, at least certainly more than reasonable for epoxy. And so I can clamp both of these together. We've got our sur marks on there, just another one there. And I could put a clamp right across here to just put a little bit of squeeze on that to hold that together. And that will be good. Um, so this all will get dressed down further, both of them. But this is close enough to get me to the point where I can put a pattern on here to cut them out to fit them into the boat. So that's the goal.
I'm going to add a little uh, filleting blend to this one just to give it a bit more body. are wet out. I'm just trying to pause it an even coat. I could use a comb for this, but I'm not going to bother. Okay, let's put this together. I'm just going to go back to back and move this over. Let's put a clamp on there. Sure marks are lined up. Hmm. Feels like these want to rise. I want to do something to try and get them all to sit down. Put some clamps on this. Put a big pad right in the middle. Got a couple there and there. I'll slide this over here. I'll scooch this as close to the middle as I can and squash it down. Okay, well, hopefully that's good. <laughs> hopefully that's good. So there we go. We've got blanks for our quarter knees made. Now in the next video, we're going to start fitting those into the boat. And I hope you'll come back and join me. If you've been enjoying these videos and you'd like to support them, I encourage you to join me over on Patreon. Over on Patreon, each of these videos gets a short article related to the subject matter, but touching on a different aspect of it that we didn't deal with in the video. And of course, mentorship is a key component of my Patreon page, so I am at the disposal of all my patrons who need a little bit of extra help to muddle their way through any problems they have on their own builds, or if they're just trying to get started and don't know where to start. So if you can join me over on Patreon, I really appreciate that. Let's all have fun building boats together. You can find links in the corner or down in the description. Okay, until next time, folks, keep your stick on the ice. And speaking of sticks, the world's biggest hockey stick, which is about an hour's drive north of me, is up for grabs. So if you're interested in a hockey stick that's 100 some odd feet long, contact the city of Duncan. They'd be happy to hear from you. You will need a flatbed truck, a big one. A really big one. And probably a chainsaw. I don't think this thing's moving in one piece.